بعدما كلم الأباء بالأنبياء قديما بأنواع وطرق كثيرة كلمنا في هذه الأيام الأخيرة في ابني الذي جعله وارثا لكل شيء الذي به أيضا عمل العالمين الذي هو بهاء مجده ورسم جوهره وحامل كل الأشياء بكلمة قدرته بعدما صنع بنفسه تطهيرا لخطايانا جلس في يمين العظمة في الأعالي صائرا أعظم من الملائكة بمقدار ما ورث اسما أفضل منهم لأنه لمن من الملائكة قال قط أنت ابني أنا اليوم ولدتك وأيضا أنا أكون له أبا وهو يكون لي ابنا وأيضا متى أدخل البكرة إلى العالم يقول ولتشجد له كل ملائكة الله وعن الملائكة يقول الصانع ملائكته رياحا وخدامه لهيب نار وأما عن الابن كرسيك يا الله إلى دهر الدهور قضيب استقامة قضيب ملكك أحببت البر وأبغضت الإثم من أجل ذلك مسحك الله إلهك بزيت الابتهاج أكثر من شركائك وأنت يا رب في البدء أسست الأرض والسماوات في عمل هي عمل يديك هي تبيد ولكن أنت تبقى وكلها كثوب تبلى وكرداء تطويها فتتغير ولكن أنت أنت وسنوك لن تفنى ثم لمن من الملائكة قال قط اجلس عن يميني حتى أضع أعداءك موطئا لقدميك أليس جميع أرواحا خادمة مرسلة للخدمة لأجل عتيدين أن يرث الأرض بارخ مرح. Zemno ki dey do ta mor tu mash ti hid moran walo ham foru qodi lan yin shom shi ho mezat ha ya rabba sar mi msil to qarish to maryam holin den o khan o wai When therefore it was evening on that day the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Shlomo kulchum, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both hands and his side. The disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus therefore said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didamos, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore were saying to him, We've seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see him, I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into his lay the side uh, or the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it into my side. Be not an unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you've seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet have believed. Many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which 
are not written in this book, but the, these have been written that you uh, may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. Shaino Eshlom Ol Kulchum Adina Dear beloved, we praise God and thank Him uh, for this day, and I pray that uh, His blessings may be poured on all of us, that no one would leave the church without carrying a, load of, a, a great amount of blessings uh, in our lives. Um, as you see and notice that uh, we are missing a lot of people today since uh, uh, a big group of us went to Montreal uh, together with the soccer team, the sport committee, to also participate uh, uh, in a game with, with uh, our community in Montreal. We pray that they would have fun. And uh, as they are present over there, uh, may they experience the unity of the body of Christ and the see in church. May they go and come back safely and have a great fun. And I pray that also as we have come to honor the Lord, that he may honor each one of us by pouring a blessing according to the need of each one of us. Today we celebrate the feast of St. Thomas and uh, lately we've been too busy celebrating the Feast of the Apostles, actually. We had the Feast of the Twelve Apostles. We had also the Feast of uh, uh, St. Peter and St. Paul. I spoke uh, last Sunday about uh, St. Peter. Uh, and uh, also, we today celebrate the Feast of St. Thomas, uh, one of the Apostles. I pray that uh, we may all be confirmed uh, on the foundation uh, of these apostles. St. Paul says that in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, that being built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and Christ himself, the cornerstone of our faith. I pray that uh, the true witness and uh, uh, the credentials of the disciples may increase our faith and that we may take them as example to see how they experience Christ how they come to know him, uh, they came to know him, uh, how they experienced in their weak weakness his faithfulness, and they were able to testify based on what they've seen, touched, and heard as a first-hand witnesses to the resurrected Christ and the only Savior of the world. Our base established on their witness and testimony, and the church, we always pray that uh, we confess in one holy uh, uh, apostolic church and Catholic church, that which means a universal church, that the Syrian church is not the only church. There are many churches, but they form the one body of Christ. So uh, regardless how denomination identify themselves or present others, Christ does consider that all those who truly believe in him, believe in the Holy Trinity, in uh, uh, the, uh, what Christ did on the cross uh, and truly have received him with repentance, have received the conversion of the Spirit, they are truly the true church on earth and thus we confess this every Sunday we get together. So, uh, speaking of the apostolic faith, a message that is inspired from the text of uh, uh, St. John chapter 20 as we have read some context about the resurrection of Christ after his resurrection his appearances uh, were recorded in the Gospels and some of which were pertaining to St. Thomas who has become labeled with the doubtful Thomas, Tuma Shakek. Uh, Thomas, however, was not the only doubtful person or uh, disciple among the twelve. 
indeed all the 12, the Bible tells us that uh, they also doubted. Yet the, the Bible sheds light over the experience and testimony of St. Thomas himself. Uh, I'm sure uh, what John ended his uh, chapter 20 with saying that these are written for you to believe and as believe, you believe you may have life uh, eternal. Uh, he said there were many things that Jesus done and said and taught. Okay? If they were written by one by one, he said, I don't believe that the books would be able to contain all the teachings of Jesus. This is an amazing statement. So, however, whatever was written tells us that, yeah, there is more. Others have, exper have experienced more. So I'm certain if the Bible were to reflect on the experience of St. Peter or Andrew or James, son of Zebedee, or John, son of Zebedee, or any of the 12 apostles, they would have told us for one by one have they came, how they came to doubt and how Christ came to restore them unto faith. However, in the summary of the life, God sheds light through St. John on the testimony of St. Thomas, who was filled with, uh, uh, um, with kind of disappointment since he was as a person, a skeptical person, he was a logical man. I see and I believe. If I don't see, I don't believe. However, that scares us sometimes, you know, seeking reason for our faith, which should not really, uh, which should not be a problem when it comes to faith. In, on many occasions, uh, I was able to tell us the difference, make known the difference between two kinds of doubts. And uh, I said that the doubt is a status, a position of faith, or relationship with God, standing before, between belief and disbelief. So you've got someone who does not believe at all, or rejects faith, doesn't believe and acknowledge God as a creator and have no faith at all in God and his gospel or his scriptures. At the same time, someone who fully believes in God, in whatever God has done. Between the two, between strong believer, true believer, and non-believer, an atheist, in the middle of that comes a person whom we might call a doubtful person. And uh, there are not many kinds of doubts, yet a uh, doubtful person could be either a person standing in the middle, turning towards faith, seeking understanding in order to be confirmed in faith, and could be an, in another position, turning towards disbelief, gearing his life towards disbelief, and trying to find a reason so that he would not believe. These are two different attitudes towards disbelief or actually towards doubt. It is not wrong at all in the life of believers to experience doubts. Indeed, we have uh, um, in the Bible records of the greatest uh, uh, faithful ones prophets and saints, apostles, who all went through this problem of doubt. Uh, Abraham, the father of faith, he is the symbol of faith. He was a person who doubted God because he delayed his promises. And that's what led him, after many years of waiting on the Lord, who said to him, I shall bless you, bless your seed, and make your seed like the stars of heaven and the earth uh, sand. You know, uh, countless the descendants shall come forth from you. Uh, he waited so long, 20, 25 years, and yet the promise of God to be fulfilled. That led him with doubt in God's promise to go and marry another woman whose name was what? You remember? Abraham married a woman called? Sarah. That was his wife from God. And there was another wife. Hagar, thank you, Mary. It is Hagar, Hajar. And Hajar, she became 
the result or the fruit of doubt. And uh, out of Hagar, he had who? Ishmael, who is the father of the Arabs. Okay? And uh, the consequence were to come later on. However, without, he went and acted in the flesh, not trusting that God could make him fruitful. Gideon, God told him, you know, uh, peace be unto you, almighty man of God. And he doubted. He said, you know, look at me. I'm a terrible person, the youngest in my tribe and the weakest. And, you know, in my t- tribe is the most terrible one, uh, the whole uh, nation of Israel. And we are enslaved. And, you know, he doubted that God can do something. Moses, at certain point, he had doubts about what God could do through him. And uh, Jeremiah had doubts. Elijah had doubts. As he was persecuted by Jezebel, the evil woman, he, you know, he thought that he's the last believer on earth. He left everything, his mission, and fled into the desert, running away from the face of the threat of, uh, were made by Jezebel, the evil woman. So it is very common in a Christian context, in a believing context, that a believer would struggle with faith, seeking a sign, a proof that God is still there at work, doing something in his or her life. Thomas, who has been labeled, unfortunately, with a believer, though he has come with the greatest confession ever made about the identity of Christ, as he saw Christ, his confession was, do you know what was it? He said to Jesus as he, Jesus came and invited him to place his fingers in his side and wounds. What did Thomas say? You remember? My Lord and my God. You know, that was the first straight, most clear statement made about the person of Christ, that he is Lord and God. Not only that, he indicated the personal rela- nature of that relationship, that Christ is not only Lord and God, he is my Lord and my God. So his struggles led him at the end to an exalted faith. A magnificent faith. However, there were reasons that led him to this experience. You know, what he had been brought up to know about Jesus, which is the misinformation about the Christ, led him, first of all, to doubt Christ. Why? He always believed that the Christ must not die. Indeed, one day Jesus said to the Jews, who do you think that the Messiah is the son of who? They said, well, the Messiah is the son of David. And uh, one day they said, we know that the Messiah shall come and shall live forever. So, based on that piece of information and uh, lacking knowledge or the crucifixion of Christ, it all resulted that I can no longer trust what I've seen in Christ. He had faith in Christ. Indeed, at one point in John chapter 11, he told Christ that, you know, we'll all go with you as he went to heal and raise the Azar. He said, we'll all go and die with him. He was willing even to die with Christ. You know, he had so much faith. He followed him, stayed three years with him. Had he had no faith, he would not have remained with him. Yet, the information that he received were not perfect information. Based on that, it resulted in a denial of Jesus rising from that. And this is what we always experience in life as we confront someone who comes with stronger proofs over against God indeed, or against the church dogma and teaching, and tells you, see, I'll give you proof that God doesn't exist. And he tries to prove through science, Someone comes from Jehovah's Witness and says, See, Jesus said, My father is greater than I. How do you dare to say that Jesus is God? See, Jesus said, I came to do, fulfill the will of him who sent me. So he's just a servant. How dare you call him God? And they would bring you verses. Now, lacking knowledge in the Bible would lead you certainly to make that commitment of denial of the divinity of Christ. Had this not happened? Well, it did. There are Syrian Orthodox families, one family at least that I've heard of, and I tried to meet with them, but they kept running away. You know, they believe that heresy. Too bad. Hell is their, you know, judgment because they rejected the truth of Christ. 
because they were, did not have a true understanding of the scriptures, of the faith, of the church. And many others, for example, being misinformed about the truth of Christ would leave the Orthodox Church. For example, someone who would receive, uh, um, you know, an experience of being born again or conversion, uh, but that would happen through, for example, a Protestant church. And I say that, and I mean that to pass a message unto you. So at certain point, they come and prove to him with a, a good desire. I'm not criticizing Protestants, but I'm criticizing the misinformation. You know, Christ is the only Savior. You don't need a mediator. You don't need a priest to save you. You don't need, you know, uh, 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 someone to be a mediator between you and God or a saint or someone. Um, the mass and traditions and whatever, you know, they have become some kind of a pagan uh, practices. And they would bring doubts into your heart about the faith and tradition. And they would tell you, see, they claim that the priest alone can forgive the sins. And Jesus, you know, is the only one who forgives sins. And uh, uh, so many other things about tradition. And they tell you, see how Jesus was... Uh, criticizing the faith of uh, all uh, uh, the Pharisees and the rituals of the Jews. So you really do not need to go to a traditional church. Christ has set us free. One person, I met a person who I'd never met, but she heard a lot about me, and she always uh, uh, liked me because of the testimonies that she heard. And uh, she trusted that I'm a you know, man of God and a believer, but she saw me with my black uh, costume, with my black robe, and she said, oh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Brother Stephanos or Reverend Stephanos, whatever, she didn't want to say Abuna, lest she, you know, makes a sin, because she also misinterpreted that, with that part. She said, did not God set you free from this tradition of wearing the black robe? See, this also is what leads sometimes to doubt. Doubt not in God, but doubt in a church. And it is the same reason. It is misinformation. You don't have complete information about faith. From the point of view of those who introduce that kind of faith, I'm sure they're not wrong. In the sense, they, what they mean, it is true. We are free from traditions. Yet, what traditions? Uh, we don't need a mediator. Well, of course. But what does the priest do? Uh, only Christ can forgive sins. True. But how does that relate to the ministers that Christ ordained? Being not formed and educated about the meanings of the true orthodoxy might teach you to doubt and you would come at a certain point, deny everything about your faith and decide to turn your back against the church and follow another church. You know, by doing this, uh, first of all, you're making a big statement about the body of Christ. These churches are the continuity of Christianity from first century till now. The teaching of Protestant churches, which I love and I admire them, I serve with them, I'm not against them, have but only appeared a few hundred years ago. And most of them, only lately in the last few decades, especially in the Middle East. And if they are true in their criticism of our faith, okay, then God is not faithful. When we, see, when we say we believe in one holy church, we're talking about the sanctification of the body of Christ since the death of Christ who established the church and built it on the rock of faith and said, you know, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. That means the church must continue. And if we are heretics, and we being the only church through the 2,000 years, then during the 2,000 years, or at least 15,000 years, Christ was dead or his promise was untrue. So God must correct himself. He created a church, but it died soon after. And then Martin Luther came and gave life to church. So I would guess that Martin Luther is the Savior. Jesus is not the Savior. 
because he's a false one. He built a church and it was destroyed. You know, these doubts about the church come from lack of information and understanding of the true faith of the church. Tell you honestly, I don't blame Protestants. I blame us. Because we've loved, lived in ignorance. We never applied the Bible on what we do. Not never, but most of the times. When we presented our faith, we presented it in a very fake way, untrue and unfaithful. We lack understanding of the scriptures, most of us in experience. And thus, you know, thus we have brought a false orthodoxy, presented a wrong orthodoxy, and that's why I don't blame others. If we cannot understand ourselves, how can we blame others for misunderstanding us? Now, when Christ appeared to Thomas, he explained to him, he showed him the place of his nails to help him believe, and then he opened his mind to understand that the Son of Man was supposed to, be, to die. Thomas forgot that the Messiah could die and rise again. He thought that he was supposed to be only, you know, stronger than uh, other nations and conquer other nations, defeat his enemies, and always live forever. Well, that is true and false at the same time because he missed on the crucifixion part. He missed that the servant of God, the Messiah who comes, he came to die for the sin of the world. And that's why being misinformed about the person of the Messiah, it led him to doubts when he saw part of the truth, not the whole truth. And it is very important in our life, in our relationship with God and with the church, to seek understanding. And it is okay to say, well, I'm a type of a person who is like Thomas, a skeptical person. I always seek understanding. St. Thomas uh, the Aquinas, he's a Roman uh, bishop who wrote uh, wonderful writings about faith. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he spoke about faith and, and he, he introduced it as faith-seeking understanding when, we, when it comes to reasoning. Reasoning, speaking of skeptical person, he says that it is faith seeking to understand. And see, St. Thomas was seeking to understand. Lacking understanding made him leave the church, leave the community. But thank God for the love of Christ and the love of the community who brought Thomas back. The disciples one went after him. Had they not gone after him, and told him, Thomas, you've missed Jesus came last Sunday. He appeared to us and he showed us all his wounds. He is resurrected. And they invited him again. And he went back to the church. The following Sunday, Jesus appeared to him and manifested himself. See, it is so dangerous. As you experience doubts over God or even over the church, that you withdraw and isolate yourself totally from the community. When that happens, then who will support you? Like, for example, Jehovah Witness came to you. They argued with you and you tried to show them your muscles by claiming that Jesus is God. You tried to prove them to them and they had a stronger reason. And then you start believing. And then you leave the church. And you isolate yourself from the church, captured totally by who? By Jehovah Witness. Then, of course... God will not be able to communicate with you because you've isolated yourself from Him. If you have any doubts, you go to church. Somebody, Abuna, told me that I should not call you Abuna, only reverend probably. Because Jesus said, do not call anyone Abuna. Well, okay, that's fine. Come and tell me and I will tell you what it means and what Jesus meant. Don't take it literally and kill your relationship with your church. That's why still many people, when they call me on TV, because they've we've been taught by those, you know, kinds of schools, Hadrat uh, Assis, Stephanos, or Al-Akh Stephanos, you know, I'm, I'm worth nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, a dust, and I'm not worthy to be called even by my name. You can call me, hey, you, you know? But the, the idea is, you're acknowledging 
a wrong teaching and a misapplication and misunderstanding that causes you to be divided from the church. And the result is, the problem is not calling a priest abuna or calling him minister or reverend. The problem is when you have this attitude, you isolate yourself from all the body of Christ and just limit yourself to the community where you go. So, you become an enemy to all the community. That's why I heard about a person just a while ago. He experienced conversion. I don't know to what extent. And I doubt that it was real. It was just mental, not spiritual. And uh, he went to his parents who had the status of St. Mary. By the way, in our Orthodox Church, we don't have that. I'm not criticizing Catholics, but we don't usually have status, statues. We don't allow that even in a church. And uh, so he went, and he took the statue of St. Mary and broke it. And said, Jesus is the only Savior. And he, his family hated him. He hated his family. He would curse them. They would curse him. And he started, he left the Catholic Church, went to a Protestant Church, and he said, you know, I know the truth. You know, the truth shall set you free. Jesus said, by this shall they know that you are my disciples by loving one another. You know, he did not understand the tradition of the Catholic Church. He misinterpreted the faith of his faith and church and family. And that misunderstanding and doubt in the church made him an enemy to the church. Instead of him being blessed and becoming blessing unto others and go to spread the good news in his family, it resulted in hatred and division in the church. See, this is lack of knowledge. Thomas had lack of knowledge about the full story of Christ. He thought that Jesus should be, shall be alive forever, but he saw him being nailed, he saw him crucified, he saw him breathing his last, he saw him engraved, and that he said, you know, that's it, can't be the Messiah. <coughs> and he was struggling. The church brought him back. You might have doubts about so many other things. You might have doubts about uh, the priest of the church. You might have doubts about someone, you know, someone in the church has insulted you in a way or another, and you don't know the whole story. Uh, I was, me and Deacon Abdo yesterday on the way to a funeral service, and uh, we were talking about one person who left the church, and uh, that person who left the church and Abdo were talking about the reasons why he left. And Abdo only discovered that all what that person was saying was not true. He acknowledged those lies, and he separated himself from the church. Why? He didn't allow himself to come and seek the whole truth. See, lacking the full story from the source would result in hatred and division and separation from God. Thomas separated himself. But we see another person, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was born to be the servant of God. Indeed, he was the fulfillment of God's prophecy and promise. And he was dedicated as a monk ordained forever to serve the Lord. And he was the one who declared, Behold the Lamb of God! He saw him coming, getting baptized, and have an opening, and Father crying, This is my Son, and the Holy Spirit descending on Christ in the shape of a dove. Yet, being in jail, in the darkness of that dungeon, he was filled with doubts, because, because he also had missed the whole story of Christ. He read the Bible and he was very prepared to believe and confess that the Messiah shall come to judge and to save and deliver. But see, he missed the point that him who came to save and deliver, he didn't come to de deliver us from Romans. He didn't come to take us out of prisons and seize persecution. He didn't come only to live, he came to die and become ransom for many. Having this misinformation led him in chapter 7 of the book of Luke 
to send his disciples from the jail, telling Jesus, Are you the one, or shall we wait for another? What is that? Doubt. And Jesus said to them, his disciples, Go and tell John, The blinds are seen, the lame are walking, the dead are rising, and blessed is he who has no doubt in me or does not stumble at me. You know, Jesus responded to the positive attitude of doubt in John the Baptist. Well, John, Jesus said about him, the greatest ever of all women's birth, those who were born of a woman. Yet we see that he himself had doubts. That's fine. But John responded in the right way. Instead of saying, Jesus left me in prison and he's supposed to deliver me, why is he ignoring me since he's mighty one as I described him and learned of him? His doubts did not separate him from Christ. He went to who? To Christ himself. He said, Lord, I have faith in you but I demand understanding for my reasons. I want to understand why this is happening. And Christ confirmed him in faith. See, we will all go through doubts. It is no problem. The problem is how you respond when you have doubts. Do you go to Christ? Do you isolate yourself from church? You have doubts. And I've known many, many families in the church that acknowledged lies. Abuna has favoritism. He loves this community or this group of people more than this group of people. Abuna has become Protestant. Uh, Abuna is, I don't know what. Abuna doesn't love me. He ignores me when he sees me in the church. When I do that, you know, unintentionally and I never to ignore anyone, and the rest was completely disaster lie, you know, they decide to withdraw from the church and leave forever. That is a doubt. That's fine. Maybe I caused you to stumble because, you know, I ignored you unintentionally. And maybe you've heard a message from me and you thought that this is unorthodox. That's fine. I might have sounded to you unorthodox. It's okay. With this doubt in you, come and seek understanding. Seek explanation. Say, I want to understand. Why is this happening? Paul's accusation. However, among doubters, we have a different kind of doubtful people. St. Paul says that the Jews seek a sign. And Jesus said to the Jews at one point, You come to ask me for a sign and shall not be given to you. Why? Didn't you say, you know, come to me and I will help you? How come... Thomas needed a sign and you gave it to him. And to others, they sought a sign and he said, no, I'm not going to give it to you. Because there was a different attitude with the claim. Thomas was seeking understanding that he had faith in him and he wanted to confirm himself in that faith. He was struggling with those doubts. Yet his heart was geared towards Christ. The Jews were trying to find an opportunity against Christ. A huge difference. Their doubts were just used as tools in their hands to just say that Christ is a false teacher. So they were attempting to deny him. They were never trying to learn who Jesus is. They never tried to understand Christ. They just came to criticize him, find a fault of him, and also, you know, lead him to death. They want to get rid of him at any rate. They saw that rising. They saw a lot of miracles, a lot of signs. Made no sense to them. And I tell you, in the church, it is the same response. Many people, no matter what you do, no matter who the priest is, no matter what the events are, the activities are, they just want to nail the church all the time. Casting falsehoods, lies over the priest and the church and over God. Because they want to justify themselves and the evil in their hearts. 
Those kind of doubters, I tell you, they will never be saved. As long as they hold onto that attitude. You have a doubt in your family between husband and wife relationship? Go seek understanding and believe what they tell you. Don't be doubtful because that destroys a relationship. It is very damaging, yet it could be a tool for building you up to make a further step in faith. When Thomas doubted, it just led him to a greater faith. When the Jews doubted, it just led them to hell. It's not the same attitude. And what kind of attitude do you have towards doubt? I pray that your faith will lead you to Christ strictly, to trust in Him and love Him. He said, this is written that you may believe, have faith. Continue to believe. Your faith is in a person. Your faith is in living God. Your faith is not in a priest or in an event or in a history. Or your faith is in a person. And he demands a continuous trust in him because everything shall change. A priest doesn't stay. A church doesn't live forever. I mean a physical church. Anything doesn't remain. Events change. Catastrophes change. Everything changes. Don't base your faith on events, but on the person of Christ, that believing you may have faith in Him. Let us pray.